Thank you, Rosario. So I, I will be presenting our uh, work uh, with uh, Carla Raffles, my supervisor, about techniques and trade-offs for vector commitments in the um, discrete log setting. So, so first, uh, let me try to motivate uh, why we care about the discrete log logarithm uh, setting. So, well, for one thing, it's uh, a, a very well understood, uh, well studied and widely used setting. It's more efficient than other settings, uh, notably the pairing setting. And uh, well, the, the good thing is that uh, improvements here kind of generalize easily. So because th there are so many, so, so few tools we can, uh, we can use, like normally you have these tools in other settings. So it makes sense to, to see what you can do there and you can only, and you can then get better things if, if you have some richer structure. So, but what is the problem? So we have some limits. So the limits in this setting is that um, we have a very, very little structure. So essentially we only have, uh, we, we are allowed only to, to do linear operations. So quadratic operations cannot be done uh, efficiently. And uh, because of that, uh, to do more fancy stuff, uh, such as proof aggregation, uh, et cetera, we, we kind of uh, need to resort to the random oracle model, which limits even further uh, the algebraic structure because it, it kind of works like that. It, it takes away the structure, so it, uh, it makes things hard. So it's uh, difficult to, to have constructions here. And uh, actually, we, we will use some weaker uh, requirements than, than the standard ones that uh, Dario presented. So uh, we will require uh, the size of the opening to be sublinear, so polylogarithmic uh, essentially in the um, in the number of uh, positions open. So because of the limitations we have, and actually because of these limitations, we also consider uh, uh, trade-offs that uh, that we can achieve, and uh, we we try to to be as abstract as possible so we can uh, uh, use all these techniques in uh, in other settings as well more uh, efficiently. So, uh, okay, so our goal is only using uh, clean algebraic and combinatorial properties and see where, where this can go. And uh, specifically in this talk, I, I will focus on two parts. So, so first, I will be present some generic uh, constructions uh, just using this uh, combinatorial and algebraic properties. And, uh, well, we will discuss some instantiations and uh, trade-offs in the discrete logarithm setting, but uh, you should bear in mind that uh, while we discuss in the discrete log setting, it's not limited to that. So you can easily instantiate in the pairing setting for, uh, for example. And then uh, we will discuss about uh, aggregation, but we will look aggregation from different uh, lens than, uh, than, it's what, uh, than what it's usually looked at. So we define a new notion that uh, we call aggregation with selective verification. And uh, we will argue why this can uh, improve efficiency and uh, we will demonstrate uh, for uh, vector commitment uh, constructions. So okay, some uh, very few preliminaries uh, to start. So first, okay, we'll go fast through this slide because uh, Russell uh, already explained it in the pairing setting. So, we just use additive uh, notation for groups, so we denote elements g to the x in uh, uh, inside brackets. And so you can see that, uh, for example, this is a Diffie-Hellman uh, tuple in this notation because it's equivalent to this. And uh, as again uh, noted by Russell, it's uh, so uh, in the discrete logarithm uh, setting we can uh, write a multi-exponentiation using uh, inner product notation. So this makes things uh, cleaner and uh, easier to, to work with. So, okay, then I want to talk about commitments. So for, for the whole talk, you can think of uh, Peterson commitments, but uh, I just want to stress out that uh, our requirements for all the constructions is uh, the, what is called algebraic commitment, which is kind of a generalization. So this means that uh, whenever you have this construction in whatever setting, you can uh, apply all, uh, all the stuff that we will see. So essentially you, you have, uh, uh, well, the standard Peterson commitment. So you sample some random elements or in general, some elements from a hard distribution. 
and uh, you encode them in the group. And then committing is, is just uh, a multi exponentiation, or as we saw in uh, an inner product uh, uh, of the vector you are committing with, uh, the, with uh, the commitment key. And verification is canonical. So if you are given uh, uh, some claim that uh, an opening of uh, C is X, you just recompute the commitment and see if it matches to what you are given. And at this point, I want to note that uh, in this talk, I, I, for the sake of simplicity, I omit uh, any privacy property. So we don't require the commitments to be hiding. Although like everything naturally uh, can be converted to, to have the hiding property. So it's, it's something very easy. So I'm just not uh, presenting it uh, here. Okay, and the final thing we will need is just the proof of knowledge of opening uh, of an algebraic commitment. So what does this mean? Well, uh, if we have a commitment key and some commitment, somebody convinces us that it knows an opening uh, of this commitment with respect to this key. Uh, so, okay, this is the language a bit more uh, formally. Well, uh, the language contains all the commitments such that the witness is the opening that is consistent with this uh, commitment. And uh, well, you can see this is as, as a membership in linear spaces. So essentially a prover will show us that uh, it knows coefficients X that it can uh, produce a linear combination of the commitment key uh, to derive the, um, the commitment. So this is a, an equivalent uh, way to see this. And uh, well, we have uh, two efficient constructions in the discrete log setting. And here, when I say efficient, I mean uh, sublinear proof size. So this is the minimum requirement we, we would want. So we have the folding technique of uh, bootlet tal and uh, improved in bullet proofs. And uh, we have uh, also has proof systems. Uh, I will not go in details on uh, how they, they work, but I will just give uh, their uh, efficiency properties. So first of all, the, the folding technique is publicly verifiable. Uh, and actually it's also transparent. So that's why the double check here. So you don't need uh, a structure of SRS or secrets to, to instantiate it. Uh, it has a linear size SRS, so a, a commitment key essentially. Uh, proving is linear, verifying is linear. So this is a big, uh, the big issue with, with this scheme. So because it, it's really nice to have a transparent construction, but you have to live with a, a linear verifier. And the proof is a logarithmic. While in the, in, for the hash proof systems, we have uh, a designated uh, verifier uh, construction, proof of knowledge. Again, the, the SRS and the, the proof uh, are linear, but now we have a very fast uh, verification property. So the time to verify and uh, the size of the proof are uh, constant, a constant number of uh, group elements. And I, I again stress out that you can generalize this. So there is a, a standard way to tra translate um, hash proof system into a quasi adaptive music in the pairing setting. So you, you keep the same properties, but now you have public verifiability, albeit with a, um, a trusted setup. Uh, okay. So let's see what can we do for uh, vector commitments. So the, the, the preliminaries I used are the only things that uh, we require. So the, the only properties is that we have a, a standard uh, commitment that is algebraic and we have a proof of knowledge uh, of opening for such a commitment. And uh, let me demonstrate how you can use that to open some position. So um, here we have a a committed vector of five elements and we just want to open uh, the fourth one. So as we said, the commitment can be seen as an inner product. So what do we do? We, well, we kind of split the commitment. So this is the green part is the part of the commitment. The verifier knows and tries to verify. So it can uh, compute it on its own, like a commitment to X4 with only using the variable, uh, the, the commitment key R4. And the red part is all, all of the rest. And uh, well, all of the rest, what do I mean by that? I mean the commitment to all the other variables in the same order, but uh, with commitment key that doesn't have uh, X4. 
And uh, well, it is easy to see that if you combine these two parts, if, if you add them, you get uh, your initial commitment. So what is the strategy to, to prove that uh, the fourth coordinate is correct? Well, we asked to the, the prover to give a proof of knowledge of opening of the red part. Uh, so that's just it. And uh, well, intuitively this works because if we have a proof of knowledge for this part, we can extract all the other coordinates and uh, we have also one coordinate, the X4. So we have um, a, an opening for the whole commitment. And uh, well, if, if the prover could uh, convince us for two different values, we would essentially extract two different openings for the same commitment, contradicting the, um, the binding property. Uh, so that's, that's the, the construction. It's quite simple. So uh, we essentially, so we call it a proof of non-membership because you saw that if you get the commitment and remove the part that you open, well, the other part is not contained in the, in the commitment key of the other part. And this is actually equivalent with uh, membership in the coordinates uh, of the rest of the, um, of the value. So we can use the constructions for membership in linear spaces we, we discussed about or, or any other uh, construction for that matter. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's the protocol. Well, the prover uh, computes the commitment to the other coordinates with the rest of the commitment key and just proves knowledge of, of it. And the verifier just verifies. So, so it, it can compute the same commitment by subtracting the, the claimed part. And uh, well, this works. Uh, like I gave an intuition for soundness. And uh, you can easily see that you can generalize this for, uh, for every subset. So you don't have to restrict yourself to subsets of size uh, one as I presented in the previous slide. So you just give, uh, if you want uh, a bigger uh, subset, so you want to open more uh, positions, well, you just do essentially the same thing, but uh, here you, you subtract uh, all the co coordinates uh, in S. So, okay, this is a reminder of the properties we had uh, for these constructions. So, as I said, we can use them, but uh, there are some issues. So, the first one involves only the hash proof system construction. So, because we cannot uh, reuse the SRS uh, and we, we should be able to open every variable, this, uh, this is bad because this means that uh, we get a quadratic number of uh, elements in the SRS, n for each uh, variable. And also, it's, it's not uh, very flexible directly using this uh, construction for, for, both, uh, for both cases because, for example, you cannot uh, pre-compute proofs and get all the trade-offs that uh, this, uh, this implies because you would need, uh, I mean, your, your, prover should be, your prover should be linear and you need uh, a quadratic uh, prover, which is not uh, feasible. So, okay. Uh, what we do is we try to, to improve on that, and uh, we do that by applying uh, the non-membership technique uh, recursively. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with hyperproofs, uh, th this is kind of an abstraction of uh, hyperproofs. So we just use generic uh, components, algebraic commitments and proof of knowledge, to, and, and the same combinatorial uh, structure to, to derive the construction. So let's see. So OK. We consider only opening uh, one coordinate. So now the, the statement is a commitment and the commitment key and the claimed opening. And, and uh, prover has the witness uh, X, which is the, op the whole opening of uh, C and wants to convince us about this part. So what we do is we, we give many such uh, proofs of non-membership. So we work as follows. So this is our initial commitment. We consider the first uh, half uh, variables and the second half, and we give the commitments to, to each with respect to the corresponding key. So here, we only use the, the first half uh, elements of the key, and here we use the rest. And then we don't stop uh, here because we don't want to open only these two sets. We, we just continue recursively and split this in half and so on and so forth until we until we, we reach the, the leaves of the tree, which each leaf contains just uh, one element. So, okay, let's see how this would work. Uh, let's focus on the ith element that uh, we want to prove for. So 
we just ask the prover to give the siblings, like in a Merkel fashion, we ask for the siblings and um, the proofs of openings of the siblings. So why does this work? It's quite intuitive. Uh, well, essentially, when you start down here, uh, with this, you can extract uh, the parent opening. And then you're given as well the sibling, so you can extract the parent opening and, and so on and so forth until you reach your, uh, your claim. And uh, well, if it agrees with your claim and uh, the prover hasn't cheated, then uh, I, having two different openings here would imply that uh, again, you get two different openings. So somewhere in the tree, actually, you get two different openings, but okay, for sure you will get them here. And uh, this, this cannot happen because uh, we require that the commitment uh, is binding. So, that's the, 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 the idea. And okay, I described uh, like the, the intuition for soundness. So essentially you, you use the soundness of the um, non-membership proof and the hybrid argument. And uh, well, why we care and we complicate things because we get some nice uh, trade-offs. So first of all, as we will see, it's cheaper to compute all, uh, all the proofs. Uh, in, in the tree than the n square we had, and uh, we can have uh, time and memory traders. So what does this mean? Because when, when you have a commitment, this, this tree is uh, fully defined. So you can, if you want, you can compute the whole tree beforehand, or you can uh, compute a part of it and save it. And uh, each time you are asked something, compute only the rest, and you, you can do this, uh, this kind of stuff. And also in uh, in the Hasproof system, in, in the Hasproof system, you reduce the size of the SRS. But okay, you have to pay a price for this, so you get um, bigger proofs. So because you need to to check a logarithmic number of uh, nodes in the tree, you get more or less this uh, this overhead. So um, a logarithmic uh, overhead. So let's let's compare. So. Here we have, we first consider only the folding technique, and this is the recursive construction. So wh what is the difference? Well, uh, to, to compute all proofs, we just need uh, quasi-linear time, so n log n time instead of n square. And uh, well, for this, we pay that uh, the proof size is uh, log square now instead of log n. But again, I, I stress out that this is a um, transparent construction. And also, like uh, to, to update all proofs, uh, you need linear time instead of quadratic. But I, I should make a note here that uh, specifically in the case of the folding technique, uh, this is a bit of abuse calling it uh, an update because, uh, uh, well, you essentially need, you can update in linear time, but you need to know the whole opening. So it's not enough to know some position or uh, some proof. So it's, it's kind of an abuse. But still, you can uh, essentially what this column says is that uh, you can recompute the tree after you change something uh, faster than uh, than the trivial. Uh, okay, and let's see the, the let's see the hash proof system. So now we also get a better SRS, so we get an n log n SRS instead of uh, a quadratic one. Uh, we have the same improvement in uh, proving all in constructing the whole tree. Uh, and now we pay the logarithmic overhead for a proof and uh, verification time, but we again improve uh, in updating. So now we need the uh, logarithmic uh, time instead of uh, linear time. And this is the, the classical notion of update in this case, because we have some, uh, in some extra homomorphic properties for this construction. So as far as uh, the keys are concerned, so I, I denote here with n that for these constructions, we need uh, n trapdoors. So uh, we need a lot of uh, designated verifier keys. And um, this is uh, undesirable. Well, why? Because normally you wouldn't want to simply use a designated verifier construction, but uh, to, to improve trust, you would, uh, you would use a committee that uh, produces the proofs and uh, make some assumption about some threshold being honest and so on. And uh, well, you, you, you would want uh, to be easy to uh, manage the keys. So maybe you want members of the committee to rotate or members going, leaving, others coming and so on. So 
it's bad that we have this number of keys. So, but the good news is that uh, we have an alternative approach uh, for the hash proof system construction, which uh, I will not have the time to present it in this talk. Uh, but uh, well, this construction has exactly the same uh, properties, but only logarithmic uh, number of keys. And uh, as I said, this can be important in these committing settings where you have to um, to handle a lot of uh, a lot of keys. So okay, that concludes the first part, and now I want to talk about uh, aggregation. So we define uh, a new notion which we call aggregation with selective uh, verification. But before going into that, let me kind of give you the the big picture. So. Well, what is aggregation? Well, normally you have two statements and uh, two proofs for these statements. So here x1 and pi1. And uh, you take the proofs and you construct a new proof uh, for both statements. And well, this is good because as, as was mentioned, it can uh, improve the efficiency. So you have uh, reduced uh, proof size and uh, probably reduced uh, verification. But we kind of take a different uh, approach in this work. So instead of uh, aggregating proofs we simply aggregate statements so what is the difference well instead of combining two proofs and constructing a, a new one uh, what we do is we just take two statements we have no proofs for them uh, so far we first aggregate the statements to a new statement and then prove the statement and uh, why do that because uh, well in general producing proofs is expensive but uh, as we will see statement aggregation can be extremely efficient so we can uh, save a lot a lot of work uh, for the prover uh, so okay let me give some motivation is this the, a quick question is this like uh, the difference between uh, proving a sub vector directly and aggregating existing proofs I, i'm sorry can you repeat i couldn't hear so when you say uh, statements do you just mean for example i know that Position x1 is x1 and position 2 is x2, and I'm just building a sub vector proof directly. Is that what you mean? Yes, you, you, you combine the statements. Yes, exactly. And then you just prove the final statement. Oh, okay, thank you. But, but the statements, so this will become clear later, but the later the statements and the aggregated statement should be of the exactly the same form. And this, uh, as we, we will see, we can uh, exploit that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, OK, let me give some motivation of the way we want to, to use that. So the motivation is a delegation of computation as a service. So what is the scenario here? Well, we have a prover denoted here with a wizard. And uh, the, the prover uh, just gives his computational uh, resources to, uh, to verifiers. So people can ask, uh, OK, can you do this computation for me? And and the prover uh, just does the computation, but of course we assume no trust between the parties, so the prover should also convince the parties about uh, correctness. So what is the scenario? Okay, some party makes a question, it gives the result and uh, some proof and, and so on. And this continues for many parties doing different uh, computations and uh, on, on different inputs. So the prover just, it's a machine that uh, does it for them. And uh, okay, this, this is too much for the prover in, uh, in concrete terms. So let's boil it down and see what the prover does. So, well, it's clearly a job of the prover to compute the, um, to, to, to make the computations that he's asked. So this first part, like making the computation is something, okay, that it should be there. But the problem is that uh, for each of this computation, it needs to produce a proof and uh, uh, as I mentioned, like this is uh, the, the bottleneck, like this is more expensive than the computation itself, and uh, it can be very heavy in, uh, in practice. So what, uh, what we try to uh, doing to improve on that is we have the prover just proving everything at once. So the new scenario goes as follows. So it's uh, partly makes some question to the prover and gets the, the response, but now it gets no proof. So for the moment, the first party acts only on uh, good faith that the prover is not cheating, it has no guarantees. And this continues and when enough parties uh, make, uh, make their statements and get the results, well, it's time for the prover to, to stand for himself and say, okay, I didn't cheat. 
everything is honest. So what it does, so the approval will just create one proof and uh, convince all of the parties. So essentially the prover aggregates all the statements it received and it produces just one new statement. And uh, well, then it simply gives a proof for this uh, statement, which is the same for all parties to, to convince them. Uh, but also it, it needs to give some small evidence that uh, to each party that is different, that essentially captures that uh, he took into account its, uh, its uh, statement. And the important thing here is that we want to do that without the parties having to communicate with each other, so they, they should only communicate uh, with the prover. So what are the requirements? So as I said, producing the proof, so using uh, an easy or something like that, the pi star uh, proof, this is the expensive part. So we want to do it as little as possible. So ideally once for many statements. And for this uh, thing to make sense, we should also require that these individualized proofs are uh, cheaper in any sense. Like because otherwise the prover can just uh, give uh, the, the initial proofs and not aggregate and do not need to do that. So we want cheap individual uh, proofs. Um, and okay, let's see what these two, if these requirements are satisfied, what happens? Well, the more statement, uh, statements aggregated, the cheaper is the prover, because as we said, this part will be done uh, only once, and this is the, the bottleneck. And there's another uh, good thing that a heavy part of the verifier's uh, job will be to just check it, checking the same proof. So you can probably exploit that and uh, gain something by, by, by this uh, fact. Uh, so okay, let's let's do some definitions and uh, let's see then the construction. So first, we need an aggregation scheme which uh, is very similar uh, to what is presented in the recent uh, paper uh, Nova. So consider a language and the relation, and then the language and the corresponding relation. And you just need here two algorithms. So the aggregating proving algorithm and uh, the corresponding verification algorithm. Well, the former takes as input two statement witness pairs and just produce a new statement witness pair and the proof of aggregation. And uh, the verification, it takes the initial statements that are supposedly aggregated and uh, the aggregated statement and the proof and says, okay, I believe that everything uh, was done correctly or I don't, I don't believe, so it's true or false. And the requirements are quite natural. So uh, first of all, we want completeness. So if here we take two pairs that are in the relation, what we produce is a pair that is as well in the relation and the proof that, uh, that verifies. So if everyone is honest, everything works essentially. And uh, we have the notion of knowledge soundness, which what it states in th this aggregation is that, uh, well, if this proof verifies, so if aggregation was done correctly, and if we are given a witness for the aggregated statement, then we get, uh, we, we can safely assume that the prover knows witnesses for both the statements X1 and uh, X2. Um, okay, now let's reinforce that and let's add the selective verification property. So a, an aggregation scheme with selective verification is, uh, again, it's first of all, it's an aggregation scheme. So you have the same, uh, Oh, and I, sorry, I should mention here that, uh, well, here we aggregate two things, but you, you can generalize it. No, you can, you can just aggregate uh, more statements at once. So this is only for simplicity. So the, if, if we have an aggregation scheme that has selective verification, it should, apart from the two algorithms we presented, that uh, the general ones should have two new ones. So the proof algorithm, it takes M, uh, statement witness pairs and it produces one proof for its uh, statement and essentially this proof says that uh, well uh, if you see the aggregated statement i will uh, I, I have considered uh, the statement xi to produce it so uh, it, it essentially proves uh, that some statement is inside it's encoded in the aggregated statement and maybe it's uh, it's helpful to consider it in some sense as a, a vector commitment, but instead of uh, committing to values, we somehow commit to statements. 
So th this thing kind of does that. So it, it, it says that, okay, this is the, the commitment. And I, I reassure you that uh, this was uh, the ith position of the commitment is some statement xi. And okay, what are the properties we want? Well, we want selective completeness, which is again natural. Like if uh, things are done honestly here, uh, things will verify. And now we have uh, selective knowledge soundness. So um, if we have a, a proof that verifies and we have an, a witness for the aggregated statement, then we have a witness for the i statement. Uh, and finally, we want some efficiency requirement because otherwise you have some trivial, con non-interesting constructions. Uh, we want the, each of these proofs to be sublinear in uh, the number of aggregated statements. And this makes sense because, uh, I mean, you should note that uh, here we do not even see the other statements and we don't want to see them because of efficiency. So we only want to be able to focus in one statement and uh, just care about that. So it's a, it's a natural uh, requirement to require some linearity in, uh, in M. And well, we can, uh, again, using only combinatorial techniques, we can, uh, uh, get an uh, aggregation scheme with selective verification just by using a standard aggregation scheme and the construction is quite natural. So again, you, you have this trees uh, uh, structure. So what you do is in the leaf, you put all the statements you want to aggregate and then uh, you apply aggregation to pairs. So you get the first two statements and you aggregate them and recall that you should get here a statement of exactly the same form. And you do that for every pair. So after that, you are with, uh, you end up with M over two statements, and then you just continue recursively. Okay, so you produce the tree, and at some point you have this uh, statement, and this, this is uh, the final uh, aggregated statement. And again, about soundness, so let's focus on the i statement. So what happens here? How would you be convinced? So the prover will give you the path to, to reach your uh, element and will give you the siblings. And well, again, you can uh, use a hybrid argument and what is the property you get? That if you have a witness for the parent node, then you should be able to get witnesses for the, um, for the children. So you can uh, apply that and uh, like start from the witness of this node and move down the tree and get a witness for the statement of... Uh, of interest. Uh, so, okay, what are the properties? Well, the prover, uh, by, by a simple argument, like the prover does a linear number of aggregation and the verifier just does a logarithmic number of aggregation uh, verification. Um, so, as, as I will argue, this in, in general, this is uh, quite, quite efficient. And so, the heavy job, which is a snark, is only done for the final statement. So, for this one. But also, you can note that uh, as a verifier, you might get the final statement, but you can easily postpone the proof and then aggregate it even further. And uh, I mean, use, use this kind of tricks to even improve uh, on, on the verifier side as well. OK, so we have everything. Let's try to apply it uh, in uh, vector commitments. So what are our statements in uh, vector commitments? Well, we have. Uh, uh, the i statement is just a commitment, a commitment CI for the i party that uh, interacts with some prover. And he wants to open at some positions, uh, i1 to ik. Uh, and the, the witness is the opening. Now there are many ways to, to do this. So I try to, to use here a, a, a clean one, not, not uh, probably the most efficient, but uh, still it. It uh, kind of uh, shows like what is underlying uh, the underlying uh, ideas. So what we will do is we, we choose to reduce it to an inner product. So an inner product is uh, a statement is a pair of commitments and some uh, value. And uh, well, you, you claim that you know openings for these two commitments such that the inner product of these openings is uh, Z. And uh, how you do this uh, reduction? Well. Um, if this is your uh, commitment, like you have all these values and you want to open the green ones, then you construct another commitment B. 
and you just put zero everywhere and you put some random values here. And then uh, you can construct the claim, uh, the claim, the inner, the, the, the inner product, because you know that everything here is zero. So the inner product can be computed by the verifier and then the prover just needs to convince about the, um, the relation. So we can uh, attack the problem of opening vector commitments by proving uh, aggregating inner product relations. So the next step is to show uh, an aggregation scheme for uh, a simple aggregation scheme for inner products. And then we can use the generic uh, compiler to get uh, selective uh, verification. So Alexandros, can I ask a yes. question? Yes, so sure. is, is this a really aggregation or is it batching? It, 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 like if it were aggregation, I would expect to see two proofs for position three and four that you combine into a proof for both of them. But what I see here is you start with the full vector. Uh, so it, it feels like you start with the full vector and you build a batch proof for positions three and four. Uh, no, I mean, this is, uh, well, <laughs> yes, you probably can see it like that, but. I just try to, to express in this slide that it's very easy to um, express this statement as an uh, inner product statement. Okay, I just, I just try to do that so then we can simply see how to aggregate in inner products. That, does it make sense? Uh, okay, okay, L let's keep going. Maybe it will make sense later. Thanks. Okay, so yes, so yes, thank you. So here in step one, I just, uh, because I don't want to aggregate uh, directly this type of statements, I just, so that okay, it's actually equivalent to, to only consider inner product, and this just demonstrates that uh, it's essentially easy to to talk about them in this way. So uh, assuming this is okay, then we can simply construct an aggregation scheme for inner products. Now we can forget about vector commitments, and then we can use the statement tree, the the, the tree that I show in the previous slide, to to get the selective verification uh, property. So. Let me demonstrate very fast how this uh, this is done. Uh, it's it's not the details are not very important, and as I said, there are probably more efficient ways to to do it. So okay, you have statements of the form of inner product. So you have two pairs of statements and two pairs of witness, one one for each, and you want to construct a new statement and uh, along with a new witness. So essentially, what you do is well, you are interested in inner product a one b one and a two b two. So you send the other pairs. So as the prover, you send A1, B2, and A2, B1. And then, well, the, the, you receive a challenge from the verifier, a challenge X. And, uh, well, you, you kind of aggregate the two witnesses using this, uh, this challenge X. Uh, and the verifier does the same thing, but it does it on the commitments. So it combines the commitments. And, it computes, like using these values, it computes the supposed new inner product. So this works, I don't want to go into details, um, but I want to stress out an, an important uh, thing. So it's, it's notable that this is very extremely fast. So essentially the, the cost of the prover is just a constant number, uh, not constant, but uh, yeah, um, linear in the size of the witness number of computations in the field. So essentially you can think about it as the cost of doing that is not, uh, is actually comparable to, to reading the witness. So it should be much faster than uh, producing proofs or doing uh, anything more, uh, more fancy. So th this is the whole point. This is how we, we improve on uh, prover efficiency. So uh, it just in, instead of aggregating proofs, if you aggregate statement, you get this type of, um, uh, of, of proving uh, complexity, like very, very close to just reading the statement. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's see an example, like how, how would this translate in the vector commitments? Well, now proving uh, M different uh, statements, so you have M different commitments and uh, some openings of them at uh, different positions. Well, you would just use one, uh, one uh, non-interactive uh, proof for, for one statement now, only for the aggregated statement, and you can use whichever proof uh, you want for that. Uh, and the real aggregation, it would involve uh, a linear number of uh, hash function computations from the prover and the linear number of essentially doing inner product in the field. So the hash function comes because we, we translate 
the public coin construction of the previous slide using the Fiat Samir uh, transform. And well, what is the verification overhead? It's a logarithmic number of uh, group uh, operations and uh, has computations. Uh, but okay, we, we can only get uh, a heuristic security because we, we, we need uh, inherently the aggregation scheme to be non-interactive and uh, we are using the, the random order. So, okay, the, the takeaway from this is that uh, for an arbitrary number of statements, we can uh, make prove, prover's life uh, much easier while incurring some cost of uh, the verifier. Uh, and okay, this okay, this was an application for uh, specifically for vector commitments, but this technique is not restricted to that. Like you can use it in much more general things. So you can uh, aggregate inner products. You can aggregate polynomial commitment openings. The relaxed uh, rank one CS construction of uh, of Nova I mentioned before, and uh, well. Uh, the, as I said, this is the, the whole point that this is much faster than doing the NISIP and uh, some other applications. So you, you can uh, use this idea to aggregate uh, SNARKs themselves. So if, if you want to do many SNARK computations, uh, you can aggregate uh, uh, th this type of computations. And uh, you can also use uh, for the aggregation uh, style of, of NOVA where well, the difference is that Nova is uh, concretely very efficient, but every statement should be for the same uh, language. While here, you can even aggregate many snarks that consider different languages and, and so on. And uh, probably many others, so because it seems kind of uh, generic as a technique. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alex. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, can I ask something? Um, yes. Um, so, well, it's maybe more like a comment because I think, uh, I'm not sure if Aline was like, um, had questions. So what I want, my comment is that this can be thought of as a delayed, um, that you're like postponing the proof, so to say. So I think that maybe that's the, the way to think about it. It's like maybe similar to this uh, um, approach for um, doing recursive proof composition in the DLOC setting, right? So maybe this clarifies where the paper stands, like where the results stand. Yes, and, and the, the other important difference is that, uh, well, you aggregate statements, but you do not care about all of them. So you just care, about your statements. So you do not care where the other, other statements come from. You don't even need to read them. So this is the, the difference with the classical proof composition uh, approaches. Yes, thanks for the comment. Alexandros, could you go back to that slide where you had this uh, hyperproof-like tree? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and when, when you said you gave a proof, the proof consisted of the sibling inner product arguments, basically, right? Inner product proofs of knowledge. And, so, and, and, yes. is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And so the proof is log squared n because each inner product argument is, is log n and you have log of them, I suppose. And, and the verification time will be linear, right? Yes, exactly. Well, and, with, and, with the folding instantiation, no? Like if you yeah. use, yes. Yeah, if, if you use, uh, could you use something else to make it nonlinear, to make it logarithmic? Uh, well, the hash proof system, well, I think I have uh, the slide. So if you use the hash proof system or in pairings, if you use the quasi adaptive music, you get a logarithmic uh, proof. I see. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't exactly understand how the hash proof stuff would work, but, but that's really cool. Is there a reference for this? Like, uh... It, uh, yes, uh, well, it, you can, if you're familiar with uh, membership in linear spaces proof, uh, you, you can think of hash proof system, the same thing, but with a designated verifier. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, otherwise it's, it's a very, um, I mean, uh, it's a very classical uh, construction. Thanks. Uh, 
cool. And the aggregation that you mentioned, like this new model of aggregation, like if you go back to that tree image, could yeah. I use the, uh, 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 no, 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 just the original uh, hyperplex oh, tree okay. uh, kind of approach. So, so I, I couldn't understand if, if what you were proposing would allow you to take, let's say two paths in this tree and aggregate them into a concise proof for the two positions. That's what I was uh, have, having difficulty understanding. Okay, I see. Well, the, the two, let's say the two parts are, uh, are different. No? In, the, in the second part with aggregation, I, I don't consider this, uh, um, this way of doing the um, aggregation. No? It, it, so in the other part, we only have the statements. We don't care how it's uh, proven. We just only care on how to aggregate. Uh, so, so the answer is you, you cannot use that technique to aggregate two paths in the street. Is, is my understanding right? It's a, yeah, it's a bit. So think of the other uh, in the aggregation as there actually exists no tree because um, you try to aggregate before producing the proof because producing the tree is expensive. So you only have the statement. But for example, uh, like I don't know if if you have the final statement. Okay, now here it's an inner product, but in any case, if you have a final statement and this statement is proving a, an opening of a vector commitment, you can use the final proof using uh, using this or, or whatever other uh, thing. But I, I try to say these are disconnected. It's not that they're related. They just have similar structures. So, yeah. Does this okay, make sense? I, I think so. I, I think maybe with more work, uh, you could potentially aggregate proofs in your first construction, but it's not clear that this technique can help you directly, as far as I can tell. Well, that's interesting, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, really cool, thank you. Thank you as well. So I still have uh, two questions, if there is time. Uh, Go ahead. Can I? So, um, Right, so I, I, my first question is, is related to what Aline asked before, and I want to make sure that I understand it correctly. So what you call aggregation is more like a way to uh, prove a lot of statements at the same time. And it's not about having already existing proofs. Uh, for example, let's, let's put it in the application of vector commitment. It's not that if you have existing proofs for position one, two, and five, then, then now you can obtain a proof for the aggregation of the right yes that's accurate like uh, yes you don't want actually to the, the whole uh, motivation is to avoid to compute these proofs in the uh, in the first place so you just do okay. it after like when you have a lot of vector commitments that you want to open only then you give one proof okay 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 and but this uh, okay in, if we think of, for example, the application of proof of space, then you have to, I mean, the, the cost is linear in the size of the vector, right? The cost of opening. Uh, in in uh, which uh, construction you're uh, referring to? Right, in general, if you now, you, even if you want to do this aggregation for many proofs, um, you have to run linearly in the size of the original vector, but now you, sort of amortize the different proofs, am I correct? Not necessarily, um, it depends. So this construction does not care about how you open the commitment. So you can use uh, whatever vector commitment uh, or well, here, whatever inner product or polynomial, I mean, depends on the language, but you can prove this thing in whichever way and you inherit all the properties. And for this part, you only care how you do the aggregation. You, th there are no proofs at this point in, uh, in, the, in the construction. So you can have, for example, constant, uh, if you use polynomial commitments, you can have constant uh, um, time for this in, okay. in the polynomial commitment setting, in the pairing setting, sorry. Okay. Does this make sense? <laughs> no, 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 it's more clear. And a very, very fast question, like if you can clarify the update all property that you mentioned in the table, uh, and uh, I mean, yes. And how this can be log n? Uh, that's uh... so. Yes. So the essentially in the fast proof systems, the, the the proofs are homomorphic, so you can uh, change something and you can uh, update the proof. So this is the the, the mention of update uh, you had in your talk. 
but uh, well, I, I kind of here abuse things to show something here that the, for for the folding technique, the proofs are not homomorphic, so you need to um, to compute them from scratch. But mm -hmm. I try to say that even in this case, so you need the whole witness here to to change the proofs. But I try to say that okay, you still uh, have some efficiency gain. Okay. Okay, and, but update all means update like. Uh, all the proofs that you are pre that you have pre-computed, yes. right? So okay. exactly, yes. And in that case, log n means like go log n per proof, log n work per proof. No, no. In the second case, it's uh, uh, yes. In the second case, uh, it's log n in total. Like okay. you, in the hash proof system, you only need to well, uh, if I find, yeah, you only need to proofs in the path. Okay, nice, nice. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.